Hi, this is Misha, and today's video is on the U.S. Military Service Revolver. And we're looking at modern ones, as you might have noticed, my collection kind of begins with the 20th century World War I, or of course, Memphis Powder. So we wanted to look at some of the uh, the service guns. And, uh, of course, there's really no, no better place to start than the classic 1917. But to, before we get there, let's kind of go back. This is a Smith & Wesson. Mark II. This is a military revolver made for Britain in 455 Ely or 455 Webley. This is in our Webley revolver video. So if you're more interested in the British Webleys and infield revolvers, please check this out. But I wanted to show because it does have some of the earlier features like the checkered diamond grips, but it still has the layering ring and the Smith. Basically, the Smith & Wesson Model 1917 is an evolution of the 1905 hand ejector, which was what Smith & Wesson called the New Century Revolver. It was just their large frame revolver. They did it in several calibers, and obviously the U.S. military adopted the, uh, the 1911 in 1911 and started putting it into production. When it was just a peacetime army, 1916 and before, there was there were enough 1911s and other older handguns to supply. But when the U.S. went to war, there were not enough. So, since 1911 production could not be ramped up any higher than it already was, they did look at opening new factories, but it was quickly determined the time it would take to tool up and train people wouldn't be worth it. They also looked about Springfield making the 1911 again, but they were too busy making 1903s. So the next best thing, they wanted to rework the existing large frame revolvers to fire the standard service 45 automatic Colt pistol round. Two companies were contracted to do this, Smith & Wesson and Colt. Both would adopt, a, uh, the military would adopt a version from each called the 1917, which are very similar. But before that, in 1915, Britain had contracted with, again, both Colt and Smith & Wesson to make guns like this. This is a Smith & Wesson. I don't have a Colt example, but this is my Smith in 455. And this just shows you that um, Smith & Wesson was already tooled up to make a military-grade revolver in a 45 caliber for Britain. And they made quite a few of those. But when the U.S. got into war, that meant it was very easy to make a version for America. This is a Smith & Wesson Substitute Standard Model 1917 revolver, chambered for four, uh, 45 ACP. And because the 45 round is rimless, they had to use moon clips. Now these are full moon clips, empty as you see. These are actually from today's shooting. But they originally used half moon clips, which held three each. But the principle is the same. Basically, it lets these eject. If I can get them in here, they're, they kind of expand a little bit. I was trying to show you. So put this around here. But Smith & Wesson would start making these in 1917. It would produce them through 1919 very early. Now they're too expanded out to shove back in, but it gives you the idea. They held the casings, and this let the ejector grab it and throw it out. Smith & Wesson actually came up with the moon clip system. I again, Originally, it was a half moon, which held three and three. They did this so they could be flat in a pouch. Later, the full moon would be adopted like this, which held all six. Smith would uh, develop that, Smith & Wesson Company. And these are basically the hand ejector, but um, slightly simplified for military production. We still have a blue finish. We have a five and a half inch barrel. We have a double single action system. We have very slab type grips, really no adornment. We have a lanyard ring here, very standard. And you know, it's just a large in frame revolver, but dependable, reliable, and uh, because it is a revolver, these worked very well in the mud and the dirt and the trenches of the war. Smith & Wesson would produce about 153,000 of these during World War I. They would also do another batch of about 10,000 in 1930 for the commercial market. 
and they would do another ba large batch of 25,000 for the Brazilian military in 1937. These are often called 1917 37s. To go along with the Smith & Wesson Model 1917, there was a Colt example, also chambered for 45 ACP, also with the 5.5 inch barrel, also had a blued finish and very smooth slab side grips with the lanyard, also double, oops, sorry, single action. This one has a stiffer hammer. I will also say the Colt is a little heavier than the Smith. Wikipedia says four ounces heavier. My scale says three, but either three to four ounces heavier than the Smith & Wesson, Wesson example. It is a very large frame revolver. This is based on Colt's new service frame. Now this was used by the military as the model 1909 in 45 long Colt. And the military bought a few, I think around 15,000. It's kind of a stopgap measure to equip the Army and Navy until the 1911 came online. So this revolver in a different form and chambered for 45 long Colt did, um, did see some military service. But this one here is 45 ACP. And, um, you know, as I said, it's called the 1917. Colt would produce under uh, somewhere, I think it was around... 151,000 and some change of these from 1917 through 1918 and after that that was pretty much it. It didn't have as much interest. It didn't really produce these in large numbers after World War I but you know, obviously it sold off leftover stock and so on and so forth. You could also find both of these sometimes with the more early checkered grips as, as they're using up old stock. But um, after World War I, most of these revolvers were put into long-term storage. And when World War II was looming, the military would dust them off in 1940 and do a census. They would find it had about 188,000 still in inventory, 96,000 Colts, and about 92,000 Smith & Wessons. A lot of them needed repair and refurbishment, and they would be parkerized. And some of them were given plastic, black type, big light grips. So of these, you know, 188, give or take, thousand, about 21,000 were sent overseas, with the rest remaining at home. Some others were given as a lend lease to Britain and France. So quite a few 1917s did see service in World War I as well. It was still around. Still a workable gun. Again, very dependable, not a flashy gun. It's been said that some soldiers even preferred these over 1911s. It was a familiar style. You know, they were automatic, especially in World War I, was a new novelty. And in World War II, there just weren't enough 1911s to go around when, when the war kicked off. And what, you know, what 1911s were being produced in 1942, the early year, were earmarked for the Army, so people like the Navy and the Marines had to kind of make do with whatever they could get their hands on. As you saw, we shot both of these today. They were a heck of a lot of fun. They still ran, obviously, very well, firing modern ammo. Moon clips are a pain in the ass to load and a much bigger pain in the ass to unload. Luckily, you can put rounds without the clips in. If you do, It'll go in and fire fine with the Smith & Wesson. You can't eject it though, you kind of have to shake it or get a pencil and knock it out. Usually though you can get a fingernail under the rim and just kind of pull it out. Smith & Wesson always had head spacing built into the cylinder bore. But Colt, the first 50,000 of its 1917s they produced, did not. They just had straight through board cylinders. So if you tried to put a 45 long, uh, excuse me, 45 ACP in, it would just fall forward. But after the first 50,000 or so, the next 100,000, they would also adopt putting a shoulder in here so you could fire them without the moon clips, even though extraction might be a little more difficult. But at least it gave you the, um, the option. But yeah, the, uh, the U.S. Model 1917, it was a substitute standard in World War I. It still saw not insignificant use in, uh, in World War II. Quite a few of these were used by the Free French and um, by the British Home Guard as well as many others. 
just a dependable old classic type revolver. We'll move on. Well, next, after the 1917s and 45 ACP, we have a couple of different revolver types that a lot of you are more familiar with because they're, they're still pretty common today and they're really good values for military U.S. military surplus. In my hands is a, is a Smith & Wesson so-called victory remo revolver or model. This is essentially a militarized and simplified for wartime production, Smith & Wesson M&P, military and police which is the gun that became the Model 10 in 1957. So this is a quintessential K-frame, medium-frame Smith & Wesson. I mean, this is just the revolver. The standard Victory fired 38 Special. And this was all a takeoff from the hand, from the um, you know, M&P, which really dates back to 1899, the early Smith the hand ejectors and 45 long Colt. You know, the whole system was improved through 1905, 1915. It's this whole series, and it really settled out to be firing a 38 caliber bullet. Before the U.S. entered World War II, Smith & Wesson would actually produce quite a large number of the military and police for Britain and its Commonwealth allies like Canada and Australia. And these would be chambered for 38 Smith & Wesson, which was analogous to 38 200, which was the standard British cartridge of the day. And really before the victory got going here, the U.S. military had purchased 85,000 M&Ps itself. The whole victory thing came from when Smith & Wesson hit 1 million serial, it was going to add a, a, a prefix to get into a new serial range, so it added a V for victory. This happened in 1942. So, around uh, February, March of that year, the slab side grips would be introduced. We have a lanyard ring, very much like on the 1917. We have a parkerized finish. The U.S. military version typically had a 4-inch barrel, although some 2-inch compact models were also used, but quite few. The British version of this gun would usually have a 5-inch barrel. Three and six inch versions were also known to exist, but are extremely rare. So, for all intents and purposes, most you will find will be either four inch if it's American, five inch British, or occasionally a two inch if it's one of the unique special ones. Typical hand ejector, much like the 1917, double, single action. Again, it's basically just like the 1917, but scaled down a bit for the 38 round. These were very popular little guns. In fact, they were standard issue in both the Navy and the Marines. Again, in the beginning days of World War II, the 1911s were in short supply, so a lot of revolvers like this were given to the Navy. Also, the Army would send a lot of theirs that they obtained to the Army Air Corps, which was the predecessor to the Air Force. These were very popular with pilots, flyers, bomber crews. They were felt to be safer to use than an automatic in their environment. In 1944, a sailor would drop one of these on a Navy ship and accidentally shoot himself. He would die. This actually led to a big thing, and Smith & Wesson was blamed, but it very quickly introduced a more updated, more uh, effective firing pin block, so if it's dropped, it will catch itself. When they did this, they would add a S to the serial. VS on new guns, or if old guns were retrofitted with the safety, they would add an S either before or after the serial. So, most all victories you'll find today will have the improved firing pin block either added retroactively or otherwise. Production would continue through August of 1945, and the, the Commonwealth nations would obtain about 570,000 and 38 Smith and Wesson, and the U.S. would obtain over 350,000 and 38 Special. So a very large number, nearly, nearly a million of these were um, were produced all told in the war. Very popular guns. In fact, as soon as the war ended in 1945, the military began a program to refurbish some of these that were worn out, and the refurbishment program would last at least through the mid 50s. These would stay victory models in service in the Air Force as late as the 80s, and the Army would keep many in service as late as Vietnam. 
as they would wear out and need more, they would also buy Model 10s, usually just off-the-shelf Model 10s, adding U.S. property marks and sometimes a lanyard loop and sometimes parkerizing when they, when they wore down. So these victories would serve aside, alongside their um, post-war brothers and the Model 10. Just a very popular 38. It did the job very well. Durable, dependable, not very heavy for what it is, and it fired a very common cartridge. It, it did what it needed to be doing. Well, Colt also had a 38 special caliber revolver in World War II. This is the Colt Commando, and this is a militarized version of that company's official police revolver. And like the Victory in Model m and it is essentially a scaled-down version in a medium frame, firing the 38 cartridge. It also has a 4-inch barrel, double, single action. There's a lot that goes into the Colt Commando history that I can't really touch on here. It'll be boring, and it'll, but it'll be in our blog article. But essentially, the military wanted Colt to produce these, but Colt was habitually late getting them into service and getting their contracts filled. In 1942, after the war began, Colt said they could deliver official polices, but the price that, that Colt argued with the military over the price, and that's where the commando came from. This was a cost-cutting savings measure that Colt introduced. It has what's sometimes called a parkerized finish, and Colt calls a matte blue. They eliminated the checkering on the cylinder latch here. And they went to these, what is called Colt Wood Synthetic Grips. They're kind of like Bakelite. No lanyard ring on these. They, they didn't have even a spot for one. So they did some little minor QC things to get them out the factory faster and to cut a few dollars off, off the cost. The military would begin by ordering about 5,000 in late 1941, early 1942, and then they would order 20,000 more, but, the, but um, Colt was slow to deliver. In 1943, the, all these revolver productions were brought under the command of the Army to kind of standardize and assure quality, and a lot of these Colt commandos were actually purchased through the, the DSC, who would in turn reissue them or sell them to um, uh, defense contractors, materials, uh, transport, guards, but some would see military service. About 16,200 were used by the military that we know of, and this was out of a total of under 51,000 made. The last Colt commandos were delivered in, uh, or excuse me, were made in February of 1945. And Colt would deliver small batches as late as 1946, including a few to the civilian market. They're basically contract overruns. But this is, just like the Smith & Wesson, a militarized version of Colt's standard Police 38. And again, like on the 1917s, this Colt weighs about 3 ounces more than the Smith & Wesson version. So while it's very, very similar, it is just a little heavier. Still a hand ejector. Of course, like any Colt, you pull to release the cylinder instead of push, and you have an unshrouded and an unlugged ejector rod. Whereas on the Smith, get over here again. You have you push it to let it go, and you've got this lug up here that locks in. Now part of this is because that way the cylinders lock. The Smith rotates out, so it rotates away from the frame. This over time could push the cylinder out so this extra support keeps it in. Whereas on the Colt, it rotates the opposite direction. It rotates towards the frame. This keeps it pretty well locked up on its own and so they never felt the extra support was necessary. I still think it's a good idea on the Smith. It, just, it keeps your ejector from sticking out there and gives it a little more support, won't get caught on things. I just think it's a neat idea. But that was the Colt Commando. It was a 38, and again, um, only about 16,000 were used by the military, but that's not to say that they weren't popular. In fact, after the Smith & Wesson had its incident of um, firing pin safety, the Navy immediately requested it be re-equipped with Colts because it didn't trust the Smiths anymore. 
but Smith & Wesson addressed the problem so quickly, and Colt, as usual, was late with its deliveries. So, again, Smith & Wesson ended up re-earning trust. In fact, after World War II, the military really, really wouldn't buy many Colts. The Air Force would buy some so-called Model 13s for its air crewmen from Colt and Smith & Wesson, but the whole air crewman project was flawed. It was an, an alloy cylinder gun, a small K-frame. It was it, Smith & Wesson would call it the Model 12, Colt would call it the Air Crewman. But that, that was all. It went into service in 1953 and was already mandatorily pulled out and destroyed in 1959 because the guns were unsafe. But as I said, the, the Air Force in particular would buy more Smith & Wessons during the 1960s and they would adopt this version here as the Model 15, the M15. And this is a Smith & Wesson M15. They would purchase M15, or excuse me, Model 15-2s and Model 15-3s. And this is what it was called the Combat Masterpiece. And all this is, is a fancier Model 10. We have this ridge running along the top with this front sight on it ramped front sight, we have a adjustable rear sight, we have a large spur target hammer, we have a ribbed trigger, and we have a nice square butt grip with the, the uh, diamond in the middle and checkering. But the, the Air Force would actually officially adopt the Model 15 as the M15 and keep these in service as well through the 80s and even as early as the, excuse me, as late as the uh, 1991 Gulf War. But it was really nothing more than a peacetime victory. I mean, the mechanics of this, it's still based on a K-frame. It still fires 38 special. Nothing really special there. This is, of course, just a civilian one. Air Force property marked Model 15s go for crazy money, even in poor condition. But this is a Dash 2, which is the same type that the Air Force purchased, and when they purchased theirs, they did purchase them off this the standard uh, production commercial line, adding Air Force property marks as necessary. So I thought I'd just pull out the Model 15 to, to be my M15 stand-in, and to show you that Smith & Wesson continued in uh, military service, whereas Colt really did not. And to be fair, Colt got more and more away from revolvers, or going into high-end revolvers like the Python. But yeah, we're just kind of doing an, a fun little overview of uh, U.S. military revolvers in the 20th century, and it was a great excuse to get out on a cool but pretty day and shoot a few of them, uh, 45 and 38 both. Hope you've enjoyed the video. If you have any questions or just want to talk U.S. Uh, US military revolvers, I'd, I'd love to do so in the comments. These don't get a lot of attention, especially this old commando here. I, before doing this video, I tried to find info on these, and... There's just not a heck of a lot out there. I will do a blog article pretty much sharing everything I learned about it. This came from a, from a friend. I appreciate him. He was a local guy named Jerry. He's had this one in his collection a long time. And uh, for the 1917s, a little uh, shout out to uh, Six Gun Strumpet. He helped me get especially the Colt, and but he actually helped me get the Smith & Wesson a few years ago as well. Both Smith & Wessons, in fact. So... Most of my cool up revolvers are, at least he kind of gave me a heads up of where they were worth for sale and kind of told me they were worth buying. But anyway, I appreciate you tuning in. Uh, please, if you get a chance, uh, like the video and uh, try to check in some of our other videos like the Webleys and, and whatever else might be of interest. And uh, we will catch you next time.